Thank you, Don. Go right ahead. All righty. So let's open this up. All right. Can you guys see that? Yes. Perfect. All right. So in in line with my column that's called Five Fun Tips about what about different animals, I thought I'd kind of spin off that concept and give you five five tips about wildlife photography. Um, so for those that don't know me, I actually think I know everybody but one person on, on the call right now. So um, just a real quick background about me. I did grow up in New Jersey um, and I moved to Colorado in 2002, most, like most people just for lifestyle. And I wanted to be around more, more wildlife. And of course, now that I live out here and I go back and visit, I've learned more about New Jersey wildlife than I wish I had paid attention when I was there, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> um, I did study communications in undergraduate, which is where my, um, my interest in photography and writing comes from. And then I have an MBA in marketing, but I've also done a lot of studying over the years of biology and public relations and computer graphics. And I've always found a way to kind of combine all those things together. So um, I did spend quite a bit of time in corporate marketing before I did leave that, um, that avenue to pursue my, my photography and writing full time, which is what I do now. And I do specialize in wildlife of high altitudes and high latitudes of the Rocky Mountains in Alaska. And I currently serve as president of the North American Nature Photography Association. Um, so I do, I live in Estes. I do write that column every week. Um, this week, actually today's, the one that comes out today should, is about pronghorn. So an animal that's not pretty common up by us, but um, on a rare occasion, you might see them on the west side. Um, but I do stay pretty busy. I do a lot of traveling and I, I have a lot of, a lot of big goals, big lofty goals that I'm still working on. And then um, I did travel full time in an RV for 15 months, mostly to photograph and write about wildlife. So these are just a couple of the articles that have been out there over the years, either about my work or that I've written and photographed for. So why wildlife photography? I know people always talk about, you know, if you're a photographer, then I get questions, well, can you photograph my wedding? And can you photograph my engagement pictures? And I'm like, no, no. I mean, I've done that, but um, for the most part, my, my focus really is wildlife photography. And I do a lot of landscape photography as well. It's it, the two combine well together. But really what, it, what it's come down to is I have found that my photography improved when I really focused on things that I was really passionate about. And I do have a lot of interest in creative interests, you know, the writing, the photography, the, you know, the PR around a lot of this and, and all, of, all of the messaging that's out there these days about how we do need to protect animals and protect our environment. Um, as well as, so that's the marketing, that's the PR that's out there, but I also can then tie in my interest with the outdoors and wildlife. Um, so, and I tell people that with any type of photography, if you, if you really want to improve your photography, I think one of the best ways to do that is, is to really narrow down into one type of photography. You know, if you want to do just architectural photography or just landscape, really focus on that. And even within that, you can, you can really specialize. And the more you can specialize and find your niche, the more that you can, um, you can really master that. And it's kind of that same concept of, you know, if you avoid the jack of all trades, you know, there's carpenters that can do plumbing work and they can do electrical work and, you know, they really don't get very good at any of it. If instead you can really master one of them, I think that does in the long run really help improve your photography. So let's talk about um, improving your own photography. So these are the five, the five tips that I'm going to talk about. Um, the triangle of light, rule of thirds, keeping it simple, um, behavior and patience. And these are all um, not all of them apply to just wildlife photography, but we'll kind of start on a general aspect with the triangle of light and the rule of thirds, and then we'll work down um, to more specifically wildlife um, focused topics. So, and I'm gonna actually, let me reduce that a little bit. So the triangle of light, um, this is what is, you know, photography is all about light. It's, it's all about how much light is hitting the sensor in your camera. It's all about what the light looks like on your subject. And these are the three ways within your camera, which is your, basically your tool that you can adjust the light. You have the ISO, the shutter and the aperture. And if you understand how ISO aperture and shutter speed affect the light and how they interact with each other, you can improve your, your photography as well. So this is really focusing on getting you off of of auto, auto focus, or not, I'm sorry, not auto focus, getting you off of auto, the auto setting on your 
camera where the camera actually selects what the, the image is gonna look like from a light perspective and photographing in the manual setting. So when you're in manual, you have to adjust the ISO shutter and aperture on your own. And if you can understand those, then you have much more control of your photograph in general. So what I'd like to describe these three things as is ISO equals your quality. The aperture gives you um, creativity and a depth of field and the shutter speed is, is your action. And I'll talk about each of these a little bit more in, in a minute. Um, but you have to think of it like accounting that if you take something from, take light from one of these three areas, you have to add it back in somehow. So it's always kind of this adjustment of, you know, how do you want your photograph to look versus how much light do you need to take for your camera to actually take that photograph? So ISO. So this was a, a moose calf down in Allen's Park and I photographed this guy. He was, he was on the side of the road um, and I photographed him. It was actually after sunset on a very rainy, you can see he, he's actually really pretty wet. Um, it was raining, it, so the light was horrible and I had to bump the ISO up to 5,000. This image on the left-hand side is actually the original image straight out of the camera. And then the image on the right is what it looked like after I did some post-processing with it in Lightroom and Photoshop. The image on the left, you can see, I even at ISO 5000, the higher the number, the, the higher the ISO number is, the more light you get in it. But the higher that number goes, the more artifacts, and I'll show you what, what I mean by artifacts in a second, the more artifacts you introduce into the photograph. So even at 5000, which is a fairly high number, um, it was still a little bit on the dark side, which is why I did need to work with it a little bit and do some, some editing to it. But it gives you an idea of in a really dark setting, a very you know thick clouds, rain, a dark animal. It gives you an idea of just what it would look like straight out of the camera. So this image, this is photographed to ISO 400, which is actually a pretty low ISO. So this is where you would have better quality, yet, and then, but you don't need a lot of the light. So on this pelican really nice lights hitting these white feathers and the white feathers are really gonna pop with, with a lot of brightness. So you don't need to introduce light into the camera. So I've done a couple of things here. Um, the F13 is the aperture setting, which would actually be a pretty small aperture. Um, so there's not a lot of light coming in there. The ISO is pretty, pretty low. So that's not allowing a lot of light in there. And at 6 40th of a second, it's, it's not super, super fast, but this bird's not really moving very far. He's just kind of sitting there. But that white is what I'm exposing for. I need to make sure that I don't overexpose that. So therefore I kind of pulled down my settings in the camera to reduce the amount of light hitting the, the frame or the um, sensor in the, within the camera. And you can see on, on this blow up of the pelican's face, it does, it's a nice clean image. It's now granted it is, it's, it's blown up and it's, it's being delivered through a screen, but this is tack sharp. It doesn't have a lot of like artifacts of which would be like little dots on it. It's a nice clean image. And that's the, the product of this lower ISO. This next image, however, is a moose on a very similar situation with the, the first moose that I showed you where it's raining, it's cloudy. This is up in Anchorage where um, very often those are the kind of settings you have. Um, and I had to, again, bump this back up to the ISO 5000. So a lot, I had to introduce a lot of light into the sensor for the camera. I also had to have it at F63, which is a pretty wide open aperture. And I'm at 1 250th of a second, which is a pretty slow shutter speed. Now moose don't move very fast most of the time. So, so that's a that's a nice benefit. And this guy was just eating a lot of these, the vegetation in this forest. Um, but you can see on the, on the blow up on the right hand side, you can see all of these little dots. You can really see it on his nose. There's a lot of little dots. That's the artifacts that I'm talking about. So that's just like, like I was mentioning with accounting, everything that you add into Lightroom or add into your camera for light, you have to kind of take it away somewhere. So if you add light with the ISO, you're also increasing that noise level. So those, that's the, always that balance in photography, especially when you're shooting in manual. And the more that you get to understand what those three things do within your camera, the ISO, the aperture, and the shutter speed, the more that you'll have an idea of, well, I don't wanna take the ISO up too much because it's gonna reduce the quality of the photograph. But if I need the light, I need to find the light someplace else then. I need to open up the aperture or I need to um, slow down the shutter speed. 
So another example is on the shutter speed. So I mentioned that this is with action. And in this case, I went to 32 hundredths of a second, but it's a bright sunny day. So I had a lot of natural light. So I reduce the ISO down to 500, which is again, a fairly, fairly low number. So that's not introducing a lot of, a lot of um, light into the, into the camera. And I did leave it at 6.3. Um, I photograph a lot of my wildlife at 6.3 because I, and we'll talk about backgrounds in a, in a few minutes, but that helps me kind of keep a clean background. But what I wanted to do, my goal for this photograph, and this is one of the benefits of photographing on manual, is that I wanted to freeze the action of this water. As this ram's walking through the water, I really wanted to catch that splashing action, um, but I needed to make sure that everything else was exposed properly. You always want to expose for the brightest points in a, in a scene within that frame. And with a ram, with bighorn sheep, elk are this way, you're going to have the, the white butt and the highlights in this water are going to be your, and the nose here are going to be your brightest spots in there. So I need to make sure that that's exposed properly. So by using those three things within that triangle, I adjust those three. Um, I want to keep it good quality. I want to have a fast shutter. Those two things are gonna reduce the amount of light. So that means I need to adjust the third thing. The, the only other option I have is to add light back in with the aperture. So by having a wide open aperture, I now have the amount of light that I need for the scene. A flip side to that with shutter speed is that if you wanna get creative with it, um, you can actually slow the shutter speed down. So this is 1 13th of a second on this, this sandhill crane that was taking off. And I wanted to get a panning action so to get that, I need to slow it down. So that's the creative side of the shutter speed. All three of these have a little bit of a creative option as well as a light option. And with shutter speed, um, slowing the shutter down can give you things like intentional camera movement where you kind of move with, you know, as you're photographing trees or anything that's stationary, if you want to make them look like they're moving or if you want to have an animal that is moving, um, capture that movement, you want to use a slow shutter speed. So again, by having a slow shutter speed, that means that I am now introducing the ability of the camera to have a lot of light come in in that slow opening of that shutter. So that means on the other two aspects of that triangle, I need to reduce the light. So I went to F14 and at F14, you've got a much smaller aperture. And again, and meaning that there's less light coming into the sensor. And then the ISO, I drop down a little bit, down to ISO 640. So again, it's always that balance. It's always, if you take it from one place, you add it to another, or if you want to, want to have a, a creative aspect, like a slow shutter speed, well, that's introducing a lot of light. So then you take it away from other spots. And then the third piece is the aperture. The aperture is what is also referred to as kind of is the diaphragm on your lens. So if you look inside the lens and you change the aperture from most most lenses, unless you have a really, um, really, really good glass, you know, for like a night photography lens, sometimes they can be at one, two, a 2.8. Most are somewhere around four, four to five, six, and then they can go up to as high as I think 32 is the highest right now. Um, and the lower the number, the wider that aperture is or that diaphragm. And if you look inside of a lens, when you open that up, you'll see the diaphragm actually open up. That's that, that um, circular piece of, it's actually blades that kind of overlap each other. It's almost kind of like the conveyor belt at the Denver International Airport where, you know, as it comes around the corner, those metal plates kind of overlap each other and then they open back up. And this is the same thing of what the aperture is doing. So the, the lower the numbers, it appears to be a lower number is actually a wide open aperture. And the higher the number goes, the smaller that opening goes. So therefore, the wider it is, the more light's coming in. The smaller it is, the less light that's coming in. The flip side to it is that the smaller the opening is, the more the, the lower the depth of field is. So for example, I photographed this moose at 5.6. And what's happened is that the depth of field is allowing me to have a lot of tack sharp detail in the fur. Oops in the fur on this moose and the antlers and on his nose. But what's happened is that the background has dropped off or softened and they call that depth of field. Um, so your depth of field is very shallow in this particular photograph where your, your depth or your, your what's tack sharp in the photo is this moose. But I didn't, I just needed to get a little bit of a sense of the place a sense of the feeling of where he is. I can tell it's fall. I can tell there's a forest back here, but it's so soft. It's not distracting and it's not conflicting with what I want people to see in the, 
the viewers to see in this photograph, and that's this moose. Now, the flip side to that is that this photograph was taken at F-22. So this is down at Colorado National Monument out in Grand Junction, Colorado. And this was taken at F-22 so that I could have everything from this foreground here all the way back to Grand Valley and the plateau in the background have everything tack sharp. And that's to give, you wanna do that with landscape photographs mostly. Um, and at F-22, the aperture gets really, really smaller. That diaphragm opening gets very small, which allows you to have that depth of field. It gives you a greater depth of field. But the flip side to it is that now you have less light coming into your sensor and therefore I need to have a slower shutter speed and a higher ISO on this, in this case to accommodate that so that I had enough, enough light for this whole scene. So those are the three aspects of what's called the triangle of light. You've got aperture, ISO, and your shutter speed. And by adjusting those three things, you can control the creative aspects of your photograph as well as the amount of light that's coming into your photograph. And then think of it like accounting. You take from one, you have to add to something else so that you get the proper exposure as well as the creative aspects of what you're looking for when you're photographing in manual. This is another example of a bighorn sheep, bighorn ram, bighorn, bighorn sheep ram. Um, what I was trying to do with this one, the, so for anybody that's been around bighorn sheep, um, they can be pretty tolerant of people. And in this particular location, they, they're especially tolerant of people. And even though this is photographed at a 500 millimeter lens, um, it is pretty close to a full frame. And I was really trying to get the detail of the eye. For most, for many ungulates, um, mountain goats, bighorn sheep, um, they actually have a rectangular pupil. And to me, this is kind of a unique thing because that allows them to have that peripheral vision that allows, because it, this is a prey animal, it gives them some peripheral vision so that they can see predators uh, approaching or any other danger approaching them. And I was really trying to capture a photograph that showed that. So I really wanted to have really deep depth of field to pick up that detail in the eye. And because he's a little bit closer, I needed to make sure it was from this scent gland here in the left side, all the way to the back of the eye but the horn and the ear weren't as important. In hindsight, if I actually wanted to do this photo, photograph again, if I had another opportunity to do it, I actually might even take this to a smaller aperture and go maybe to like an F20 or an F18 and start picking up some of that detail in the ear and the horn. Um, or I can make it a really dramatic photograph and go to like F4 and just have the pupil tack sharp and then this would actually be softer around here kind of looking like what you see with the eye here so again this is just a creative thing it's you know i'm always kind of looking for something a little bit different to photograph with wildlife especially on an animal that i photograph a lot and so this was just something that i was trying to get a little bit creative on again you can see that with the um with this burrowing owl so this is photographed to f11 and i wanted to make sure that from the tip of his beak to the back of his head um everything was, was tack sharp. So I have good depth of field here. I have deep depth of field. I'm picking up, I'm picking up all of that detail. Whereas if I had photographed instead of F11, if I had photographed this at F4, I might only have the eyes tack sharp and his beak and the back of his head would actually soften out. So again, that's what they refer to as depth of field. So the next thing I wanted to talk about, so our next tip or second tip is rule of thirds. And this is, um, I kind of call it not, a, not so much a rule, but kind of a guideline, but it does actually work well with the way our brains look at a photograph. Our brains want something that's dynamic. And if you place something in the center of a photograph, it becomes stagnant. It really doesn't have any, any unique place to move within a photograph. And by using the rule of thirds and placing your subject in what they call the cross point. So these four cross points um, that are created by creating three horizontal rows and three vertical rows, it, cr it creates these four cross points. Um, and by placing your subject in one of those four cross points, it actually creates more of a dynamic feeling within the photograph. It's, a, it's an implied feeling. Um, and our brains and our eyes actually prefer this. If you ever watch an interview with people, um, they're often set off to the left or the right side of the frame. And it's kind of, it's the same concept. If the, if the person was sitting right in the middle of the frame looking straight at you, it would feel a little bit intimidating. And by having it, uh, that person being interviewed off to the left or to the right, then at that point, it becomes a little bit more 
conversational. It becomes, you know, they're not looking directly at you. So it's not quite as intimidating. Um, so by placing your subject off to the left or the right or the top or the bottom in a photograph, it actually helps with the story you're trying to, to, to talk about within the photo. So this is another example of a moose standing in a lake. And if you take those four cross hit or those four points, now I've placed this cow in the left, you know, the majority of, of her is on this left side of the photograph. Um, the, the body of the cow and then the reflection of the cow are taking up that left, those two points on the left side. And then there's some space in front of her and it gives some breathing room within the photograph. It gives some implied movement for this cow to move into the scene. There's nothing wasted behind her. There's no content back here that doesn't add anything to the story of the photograph. Again, this is another moose, um, same kind of concept. I've placed him on the left side. I tend, for some reason I find, I, I do a lot of my subjects on the left side. It must have something to do with how my brain kind of looks at things, but, but again, it's kind of that same thing. It gives some space around here. This is a shallow depth of field where I've had, because it's a low light situation. And actually my goal with this is I was trying to pick up the backlighting on the velvet that was on his antlers. So dark animal, if I had exposed for him, it would have overexposed everything in the background here. So I went with a wide open aperture to get enough light into the seam, but the wide open aperture actually softens that depth of field again. So again, some of those creative decisions that I made, but the, from a rule of thirds perspective, he's placed on the left-hand side. And again, these left two, two cross points. Um, keeping it simple. So this is the third tip within those five tips. Um, and within keeping it simple, there's four concepts I wanted to talk about. There's, it's one subject, clean backgrounds, avoid mergers and avoid distracting objects. And this photograph of this cardinal actually demonstrates all three of them. So I have, actually there's five. Um, so I've got the rule of thirds. So if you think of those four cross points, I've put this male cardinal on the left-hand side again. Like I said, I like those left sides for whatever reason. Um, there's a nice diagonal line moving through this, which gives the photograph some, some dynamic movement. Nothing is centered within the photograph. Nothing is overlapping. If you can see, like none of these little pieces of Spanish moss are overlapping with the tail. There's nothing distracting in the background. There's no bright spots in this background. Um, I, it's a clean background so that's you know it's a nice soft with what they call bokeh in the background so that shallow depth of field is giving me that nice soft background and there's just a single subject it's not conflicting as to what I'm trying to get you as a viewer to look at within this photograph I want you to look at this cardinal not another bird on the left there's not like a little foot coming in from the branch there's not um, another branch coming in that would be distracting. I, it is clear there is one subject on a clean background. There's no mergers. There's no intersections that, that could potentially create some um, struggle for your eye to say, well, what happened here? Is something wrong with the tail if, if something was crossing over? And there's no distracting subjects. So again, here's another example of one subject. It avoids the confusion on what you're trying to tell the story. You don't see elk. In Estes Park, we see them quite a bit in the in the lake, but in general, you don't you see them more on land than you do in water. And this cow happened to be out with a herd, a fairly large herd, out in the water in Lake Estes. And I wanted to photograph just her um, standing in the water. You know, a little bit of her reflection. I've given the indication of not cutting off the legs. There's enough space below her that um, I haven't cropped it just below her body, which would give the feeling of cutting off legs. So I've given enough space to give that impression. And I've just separated her out. I've simplified the image, kept it simple with one subject with a clean background, nothing distracting in it so that I can say, I want to show the story of this cow elk standing in the water. Why is she standing in the water? It happened to be a warm, sunny day. Um, so by separating that animal out, that kind of helps with that story. So this is an example of a photograph. I, I take a lot of photos showing animals. Um, I like to, to do a lot of photography about animal behavior. And that was actually why I photographed this deer in that the behavior is that a deer is a prey animal and they hide a lot in thick cover and very similar cover, cover to the color of their fur. But it also is a really good example of a really bad background. There's all kinds of stuff going on in here. 
you you actually go your eye kind of goes to the sky back here because it's always good your eye will always go to the brightest spot in a photo so your eye goes to this in to this spot up here and not to the deer from a deer's perspective that's what it wants it doesn't want you to see it here but from a photography perspective it's actually not a very good photo because you are distracted from from all this other busy stuff going on and the colors that are in there so this is an, an example of a bad background, whereas in a different photograph, this gambles quail is sitting on this, this fence post, but this is a nice clean background. Nothing distracting back here, nothing you know, intersecting into the frame. There's nothing intersecting with the bird. There's a lot of separation between the bird and the frame of the, the actual photograph. So your, your eye is drawn right into this bird. Um, the bird's looking into the frame. There's nice diagonal lines. You know, they've got a line kind of going up in that third third portion, those two cross points in the rule of thirds. Bird's looking into the frame. So there's a lot of good things working here. So again, you want to avoid busy backgrounds. It, um, as I mentioned, it can give the impression of cutting off a head or removing limbs. So like with the I gave her the cow elk, I gave her enough space below um, where her body entered the water to give the impression of her legs still being there. Um, the cardinal, I wanted to make sure that that moss didn't overlap with the tail and kind of give the impression of cutting the feathers off on the tail. It's all very subtle things, but these are the things that kind of differentiate a good photograph from a better photograph. Same thing with the sage grouse. I happened to be in a location where the grouse was sitting up on top of a snow pile. And by doing that, and by positioning myself, the background was actually really far away. And I, I positioned myself to make sure that there wasn't anything distracting back here. There's nothing red or yellow or any bright colors. It's a very monotone background. And this bird is sharp on a really soft background. So a real shallow depth of field again. So if you use a plain or distant background or shallow depth of field um, by using a wide open aperture can help you with that. The other thing you can do is by getting low, you can help to push the background farther away from your subject. So like with this sage grouse, if I had photographed it, so I was kind of sitting down a little bit. I think this, I want to say the snow pile is maybe about two feet off the ground. But if I had actually stood up, I would have been kind of photographing down towards the grouse and picking up more of the background behind it. So if you think about it, if you photograph down on a subject, it reduces the importance of that subject, as well as the fact that it now creates physically, the background is much closer. It's only gonna be a few inches or maybe a foot behind it. Where if you can actually get down lower to an animal's eye level, you push or that background now becomes much farther away just by physical direction of what you're looking at. So here are a couple of other examples of clean backgrounds. Adorable fox kit, there's a lot going on where, where this den was actually located. There was a lot of stuff going on back here. This fox, on the other hand, it's you know by catching the fox, actually framing its face against its own body, it's a nice, clean, softer background. Here's another example. Um, I love the interaction with this, this calf with its mother, but by taking a frame of the two of these guys with this other cow behind them now it becomes distracting. You know, there's some intersection here between this back end of this elk and the ear and the nose of the the um, of the in, the interesting piece of what's going on in this photograph. Whereas this one would be a, a much better situation where this pika is set against a really clean background. You know, it, it's sitting up on a rock. I got myself down lower. It it pushes the background farther away rather than looking down on the pica. So it gives a much cleaner perspective of what I want the viewer to see in the photograph. This is another example of pushing the background. So by, you know, ducks that are, that are floating in the water, um, if you stood on the bank of a lake and photographed down on them, you would actually get more of like the top of their head and the top of their back. And then by photographing down, you literally have the back of the you know, from where the head is, would only be you know, probably about four or five inches behind this wood duck's head. But by actually sitting down on the edge of the lake or a pond, you now force the background to be, you know, rather than he, because you're focused on the eyes of this duck, now the backgrounds become several feet behind behind the, the bird. And by using a wide open aperture, you, you create a much softer background. Same thing here with this, this bear. I was sitting on the edge of a creek um, as the bear swam across the creek. 
So by having it at that eye level angle, I'm now pushing the background to be much farther away and it doesn't have any of those distracting things in it. No branches, no other colors, very simple, simple background. Mergers are along those same lines. So this silhouette of the Sandhill Crane is actually, so this blackness has actually merged into the background um, behind the bird. So there's you know other birds back here and there's probably some plants, but it's all black. So you can't distinguish exactly where your subject is. And for the viewer, that becomes confusing. You know, what am I looking at? What is it doing? Is it, you know, is its beak end here? Does it end, you know, is it like three feet long? I can't tell. So just by moving your physical presence, if you can, in a safe manner and not affecting any of the animals, you know, you don't want to ever disturb any of the animals with what they're doing. If you can find another spot or another subject that has a clean background around it, now there's no mergers anymore. And you can clearly distinguish exactly what this is. This is a single sandhill crane. You can clearly see that, you know, where its beak is, it doesn't overlap with it, you know, the front of its chest. You can clearly see both legs um, and then you've captured the reflection on it as well. Same thing here with these two bears or three bears. So there's actually um, two cubs here and a, and a sow, but you can't tell, you can only see the one and there's no clear delineation as to what these two other shapes are below it. And then in this photograph on the right hand side, now you can see mom sitting there on the left and the two cubs are sitting up. Um, so now you've got three distinct objects and shapes and you can see what what your view now your viewer will see exactly what you want them to see distracting objects so even though i i love this photograph of this this white crowned sparrow i love that you know it was sitting on this this bush with some some bugs in its mouth what bothers me about it is this yellow blob back here and a little bit of this yellow down here in the right hand side this is what i talk about with distracting objects in the background so there's a couple things you can do with that. One, you could clone it out in Photoshop, depending upon how you're using your photos. If um, a lot of Associated Press styles, if you're ever gonna publish things, do not allow you to take those types of things out. Um, photo contests, a lot of times will not allow you to take those things out. So what you could do is as you're taking the photograph, look for those things in the background. You know, Don't just look at your subject, but look at what's in the background too. And by doing those, you'll, you'll, you'll start to see some of these things and go, oh, I need to move two feet to the left or a little bit to the right, just to you know, maybe actually just place this you know, yellow flower is what I'm assuming it was. And maybe you can use the, the subject to actually block that. Same thing with these plants in the front. So I made sure that the shadow of this branch here didn't block the, the eye. Um, you wanna make sure that the eye is always tack sharp and, and is visible. So I'm, that was something very conscientious that I did. Another thing you could do is you could make this a vertical. By making it a vertical image, you would crop that, that off. And that would be allowed if you were publishing or submitting to a contest. Another example would be this Willet. This was photographed at, wa at, at water level. Um, I do use a, a device called a, um, a skimmer pod that I can use to actually raise my, my camera off of the ground a little bit and actually photograph. I'll lay down in sand and photograph birds like that. But what it does is this is a really good example of pushing that background. So it's made the background physically farther away just by changing the angle of where you're photographing from the view you have. So then the fourth thing that I wanted to talk about is behavior. So this is where we start getting into things that are real specific to wildlife versus say landscape photography or architecture photography. Behavior and wildlife photography is gonna make or break your photographs. The more you can know about the, your subject, the more you know about the behavior of what those animals do, the better opportunities you'll have for capturing those more exciting moments and being in the right place at the right time. So you need to prepare yourself. You need to understand that behavior. You need to anticipate the action. So for example, this is a brown bear cub, chisley bear cub up on the Alcan Highway up in Canada. And um, it was, he was there with his mother and they were both feeding on the side of the highway. And I happened to see this little, you know, there was some road trash basically along the road. It's a piece of tire. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, cub, cubs get real playful, especially when mom's feeding. Um, you know, he might get distracted by this. And you know, so I positioned myself where I could have 
the I was you know, far enough away from from this piece of tire, but I was really hoping that maybe this cub would come over and pick it up and just kind of play with it for a little bit. And sure enough, he did. Um, and it just gives you know, in some ways, it actually is an interesting kind of an environmental type story of you know that combination of wildlife and human. Um, so you know, road trash and why we shouldn't leave road trash out. And um, so you know, there's a little bit more of a story there than just a bear sitting on the side of the road. Preparation is, um, when it comes to wildlife, is you have to know the seasons for what kind of wildlife photos you want to capture. So for example, if, you, if you've ever been into Rocky Mountain National Park in the middle of September, the end of September, you know how many people wind up in there, and that's because of the elk rut. If you want to photograph the elk rut, if you want to photograph bull elk bugling, if you want to photograph bull elk sparring, if you want to photograph... Um, you know, the, the change of seasons of snow falling on fall colors, you have to be in there at a certain time of year. The bugling doesn't happen in the middle of March. Um, by the middle of March, antlers are starting to fall off. So you're not going to get much um, sparring action between, between the bulls. So you have to understand what that behavior is. You have to understand when does that behavior happen? Why does it happen? And how do I anticipate it happening? Um, so you need to, need to study animals. Another example of that is this brown bear. Brown bears, I take a group up to Lake Clark every year to photograph brown bears. And sometimes we go in June, sometimes we go in July, and sometimes we'll go in August. Um, sometimes we go in September even. And every one of those seasons has something different for it. If you want fishing bear photographs, like this this bear, I, I thought there was, maybe not there was actually a salmon she was going after a salmon in this creek and that's why you know she's just splashing water everywhere but you can see this was photographed in september in june this action this behavior does not happen in june they do more clamming they do more um feeding in the sedge meadows and even in june a lot of the sedge meadows haven't really grown real real thick yet so they rely on they have to find food in other places and with all wildlife, everything is always about mating and food. And food is basically keeping them healthy so they can mate. So the, you know, follow the food. If you know where the animal, what the animal likes to eat and you know where to find that, then ultimately you're gonna find the animal in that spot eating. Another example is moose. Moose, their primary food is willow. No matter what time of year it is, they like the willow leaves in the summertime, they'll eat the willow bark and branches in the wintertime. So look for willow bottoms. And if you see them munched on, if you see them browsed on, there's a good chance there's a moose in the area that's been feeding on them. So understanding that behavior, and that really doesn't have anything to do with understanding how to use your camera or anything. This is just with wildlife photography, it really improves your, your, wild, your photographs if you understand what you're looking for, what type of behavior, when does that happen, and how do I know where to find them? So you want to read and learn about animals before you get in the field. I do use a lot of, um, I have a lot of field guides. I have um, Audubon, Sibley's, and Peterson's, depending upon what kind of animal I'm looking for. Research the best locations. There's so much information out on the web these days. You can call local visitor centers and chambers of commerce or U.S. Forest, or Forest Service or a the National Park Office, um, a lot of times they'll give you pretty good information about what to expect, where, you know, what's kind of happening that time of year. Um, look up photos and information on social media apps and, and blogs written by other photographers. Um, I use Flickr, Instagram, and photographer blogs quite a bit. And as an example, this lease turn, I spent all last winter down in um, Louisiana, and um, where we stay is not far from some coastline in Mississippi. And I know that there's this one particular spot where the least terns, which are actually endangered, they actually have a fairly large nesting colony. It's the largest nesting colony of least terns in the US. So I did some research about, well, what time of year? What's the behavior? What am I looking for? And I learned a lot about the least terns so that before I even went out into the field, I knew what to expect. So for example, these least terns, the males will actually go out and they'll, they'll hunt these little tiny fish on these little tiny silverfish, almost like, um, I don't know, call them guppies, but they're like little, just little tiny feeder fish type things. And they'll go out and they'll, they'll go catch these fish. And then they bring them back to the females that are, that'll stay back on the beach. And they present them to them as this kind of a courtship behavior. And that's one of the first things that happens almost immediately upon their return in April and May. So by understanding and doing a lot of reading, and I, these were two, um, blogs that I, I pulled up from photographers down in that area. 
um, and by doing some reading in, in some of my, my field guides, I had started to learn, all right, when do they migrate in? Where do they go? What kind of habitat are they looking for? So that was the beach along the Mississippi coast. What kind of behavior are they doing? Those are the types of things I wanna photograph. When does that start? How long does it last? And then, the, then the females will sit on the eggs. And then I know that that's kind of a slower season. So those couple of two or three weeks that they're sitting on eggs, it's probably actually it's probably about three or four weeks. There's not going to be much happening. And then I, then if you want to get the chick shots, you have to kind of back out and say, all right, well, when did the birds arrive? And how long do they nest? And I know how long they nest. And I know when those chicks are going to be born. When are those eggs going to hatch? You want to catch those chicks as small as possible. So it's all about timing. And of course, there's all kinds of variables that fall into this. You know, um, climate change is certainly changing a lot of this and storms. Unfortunately, this particular location got hit really bad by a couple of hurricanes in the last couple of years. So the numbers are down. Um, but the birds seem to still be coming back. And it's all that research that, it, that I looked at to kind of improve the photographs. Nickerson Beach in Long Island is another example of where there are a lot of nesting birds. Um, and throughout the season, you start getting there's some birds that arrive really early in April and May, and then there's some that don't even start um, the nesting behavior until July. So there's some birds that you can still photograph in July and August there. But I went on to a blog written by Greg Gard, which is actually getting a little bit um, dated now, not so much. Um, I think they, they've, this is a popular beach for, for photography, and I think they've had some challenges there with too many people showing up. So I think he's kind of backed off on posting a lot of information, but there's still quite a bit of info out there on online where you can learn about different behaviors, as well as just how to appropriately behave when you are out in the field too. That's a big thing these days to make sure that you, know, you stay the appropriate distance, you have the right equipment so that you can get the photographs you want without having to approach animals, um, and then watching for behavior for stress. Like for example, the, the least turns, um, I probably should have put it in this, um, if a least term feels that their chicks are threatened, they'll poop on you. So it's, I've had um, just walking off of Nickerson Beach once, I actually had a turn poop on one of my um, camera bags where I had uh, like this big streak of white poop down the back of it. And it's just, that's what they do. So if you start seeing some of those kinds of behaviors, you know, you, you know you've kind of pushed them a little bit too much and it's time to back off. Um, so another example is horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs on the, on the Jersey and Delaware um, coasts or this, it's this crazy mating season where like thousands of them will come in. You literally see them coming in the ocean or in the bay, in Delaware Bay. Um, you'll see them coming in the water and they all come up on the beach at, at sunset. Um, and it only happens during the full moon for about six weeks. So there's usually about, I think there's usually about three chances for it. I think it's the full moon and the new moon actually. So you get three chances where there's only a couple of nights where they'll do this. And again, that's the behavior. If you show up in, and it happens in May and June, if you show up in August, you just, you won't see it. You, maybe you'll see one single horseshoe crab on the beach, but you won't see these hundreds or thousands of, of crabs kind of all climbing over each other on, on, the, on the shoreline. So again, doing some research and doing some, some information hunting about what to expect, when to expect it and how to be there at the right time. Understanding behavior, um, the better you can understand, the better your chances for capturing particular behavior. So for example, bald eagles will poo before they fly. They don't always fly after they poo, but if they will fly, they will poo before they fly. So if you want a flight shot or take, you know, a photograph of a bald eagle taking off, just look for them poo pooing. Otherwise they'll just sit there on the branch. If you want to photograph a bald eagle catching a fish, so there's a, a fish in this guy's talons, um, don't try, one of the ways that you can improve your success with this is to focus actually on the fish in the water. You watch for little ripples in the water. If you see bald eagles sitting around in the trees nearby, watch the, the surface of the water for little ripples of fish and focus on that. A lot of times the bald eagles will come in and then you'll be tack sharp on where the eagle takes the fish out of the water so that you can actually improve your chance of actually getting the photo sharp rather than kind of panning in with the, the, with the bird itself. And then other th other behavior things with bald eagles, like if you want to photograph them catching fish out on the beach, um, there's a lot of bald eagles up in Alaska. Look for, follow the tide charts. 
you know, the, as the tide rolls back out, it will leave fish, fish scraps. It'll leave food for them on the beach. So as the tide rolls, rolls out, eagles actually will come into the beaches and you can get better photographs than when the water is a higher level and the, the eagles can't get the fish out of the water. Um, anticipating action. So bighorns, this is just another example. The better you can understand behavior or watch animals. If you wanna capture bighorn rams doing headbutting, what they'll actually do is they back up almost like a spring loaded hit. So they, the two rams will back up a little bit and then they come together and do a head headbutt. Um, so if you focus your camera on one of those sheep as it's backing up and then track with it, that's when you get those, you know, you'll get the tack sharp action because what will happen is that if you anticipate where they will hit heads, your camera will actually focus in the background and miss the focus on the animals themselves. So by tracking with the, one of these two sheep coming in, then you have a better chance of making sure your photo is tack sharp and catching that moment of impact. Um, Another thing is, you know, anticipating action is all ungulates have a, they actually have a scent gland. And then when they're in their rut season, um, as the males will follow the females around, a lot of times you'll see them sniff urine. Um, elk do it, I've seen deer do it, moose will do it, sheep will do it, mountain goats do it. And then what happens is that the, when the male goes up and sniffs that urine, a lot of times he'll come up and do what's called a Fleming response or a lip curl. And that is basically, it looks really funny. It just is this comical little look on these animals, but they have, it basically allows them to get the pheromones into their nose and determine if that, that female is in heat um, and ready for mating. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing to photograph, but it doesn't happen for very long. So if you see it, a lot of times by the time you see it, get your camera focused on the animal and get your settings right, you can miss that, that behavior. But by understanding when it happens, you can anticipate it and then capture that because now you're ready once it starts to happen rather than reacting to it. And then the final thing with wildlife photography is that it just takes a lot of patience. A lot of these photographs take a long time. Um, you can see the years. If you've been reading the captions under the photograph, these are over many, many years. Um, you know, these don't happen just, just in the course of, you know, a, of one sitting or one photo outing. As an example, this American Martin, this was photographed up in Minnesota. Um, it happened to be a spot where I know Martins um, come in to hunt squ uh, squirrels that, that feed at feeders. So I sat there on a, I think it was negative 14 degrees, sat in the car, don't sit in the car with the heat on because if you have heat on, then you have heat waves and the car is creating heat waves and you won't get a sharp photo. So you have to sit there in the cold and by sitting there, you just have to sit and wait and wait and wait. And this guy finally showed up. He spent about 15 minutes there and he was gone after about, I think the, I did it for two days. One day it would took me about two hours. The other day it took me about four hours before one would show up. So I, you know, don't chase animals around. I anticipate where I expect them to be. And then I position myself to, to get those photographs that I'm looking for. Same thing for bull elk. Um, you know, this is a behavior that doesn't happen very often when you get backlit. You have to have backlit to catch the breath when a bull elk bugles. So there's a couple, couple limitations here. You've got, you have to be during the fall, during the rut season. You have to have a bull where he is positioned where there's light behind him and you're actually kind of photographing towards the light. And then you have to have a morning where it's cold and you actually have to have some humidity in the air so that the breath actually, that humidity kind of condenses as soon as it hits the cold air. So you actually don't see it very often. Um, you know, it, it just takes a, a long time. I've only, you know, in the 10, 15 years that I've been doing this, um, I've only captured a couple of the photos that I'm happy with. I've only captured it a few, a handful of times, but it's something to look for. If that's a photo you want, you have to look for those conditions. You look for the cold temperatures, you look for a sunny morning, you look for an, a bull elk that's in position where there might be a dark background with, you know, some backlighting on them. And then you get yourself in those into that position and be ready to to take the photograph. Um, brown bears in Alaska. I've been up there. I think this next this summer was I think my thirteenth trip up there, and I still don't have photos that I'd like to get. I still don't have a lot of fishing photos or um, you know fish jumping out of the water in front of bears. I just this summer was the first time there's a the lodge where we go to. They have this wood carving of a bear. And this summer was the first time I'd actually seen a bear 
doing a back scratch on it. So there's certain things that you just have to either kind of repeat, you have to wait, you have to give yourself some time and patience um, and know what you want before it before you get up there so that when you potentially see that action happening or that behavior happening, you are ready to go with the right settings and being in the right place at the right, at the right time. Um, and always have your camera with you. I know this is actually um, something I photographed just this past weekend. Um, I have lots of photos of bull elk sparring, but I had never seen it actually in water. Um, this was in Lake Estes when two two bull elk were following a herd. Gosh, it was probably about a hundred elk, and it was this huge. I think all the elk in town had kind of kind of converged together. I think they've start kind of they look like they're starting to migrate down into the foothills now. But um, yeah, these two were following up the the rear of the, the crowd, and then this one just kind of turned around and started jamming in with the other one. Um, and so the two of them started sparring in the water. But the only reason I saw it was I I saw that the elk kind of crossing the, the water i saw them kind of hanging out I, you know i just knew there, there was a potential for that opportunity the light was gorgeous it was the right time of day and i happened to have my camera with me so of course all of this can take a little bit of luck animals don't don't take much instruction from us on, on what i do i ask them all the time it's like please go here please go there but 99 percent of the time they don't listen to me and they aren't paying attention <laughs> um so my equipment for wildlife photography, I have three camera bodies. I keep my 500, my 80 to 400 and my wide angle lens, one on each of those bodies. I do not like changing my lenses when I'm out in the field. Um, if I'm traveling somewhere, a lot of times I can only have two, two bodies with me. And if I do need to change lenses, I do it inside. I don't like to change out in wind and I don't like to change out in salt by salt water or sand. Um, you know, it, it, all it takes is, is one drop in that sand and water and your, your lens will be shot. So I do try to keep three, three bodies. I use a 580 to 400 and my 24 to 70 of the three lenses I use the most, but I also have a 16 to 85, a 105 and a 60 that I use for more specific types of things. I have a 1.4 teleconverter and a 2.0 tele so that I can get a little bit closer with my 500 millimeter lens. Um, for stability, I use a carbon fiber tripod with a Wimberly gimbal head. Um, and I use a bean bag for shooting from the window of my truck, or I use that skimmer pod that I mentioned. That's what this disc thing is that's sitting here in the sand. It's kind of like a frying pan. And then you can put a, a ball head or there's an attachment you can put to put the foot of your lens on it. And then you just kind of, that helps you get these really low angles like this bird here, this common turn um, down on that I photographed while I was laying down on the sand. And then if you don't have a long lens, I tell a lot of people this all the time, think about just doing a landscape with the wildlife in it. Um, you know, show where these animals live. This is up on Trail Ridge Road in Rocky Mountain where the elk go up in the summertime. This is mountain goats up on Mount Evans in the fall where, you know, the color is just gorgeous. Show their environment. Don't worry about getting so close to them and just make a wider photograph. And more than likely, this is what you're going to want on your walls versus a really close up full frame shot of something. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then I like showing these. These are those things that we missed. This is a full frame shot. I did um, see this. This was a fairly nice uh, buck, mule deer buck that had a really nice set of antlers. And I saw him coming and I couldn't get my, my camera gear together in time to catch him jumping over the plants. He was kind of following some does and I knew the does did the same exact thing prior to him. And because I knew he was following them, I knew where he was gonna go. I just couldn't get everything together. And it happens, we have lots of these types of photos. So that's the way it goes sometimes with wildlife. Um, if you wanna get better at read, I do a lot of reading, whether it's magazines, books, online, um, forums, blog posts, all kinds of things. Look at other photographers. You know, there, there's, I always, I, I just told this to somebody the other day, you know, he's like, I feel like I've plateaued with my photography. I'm like, do you have photo books at home? Do you have coffee table books? Do you have a library near you? Go pick up some of these books or go to a local museum and start looking at other things that catch your eye and start asking yourself, why do they catch your eye? What is it about them? And then you can start to apply some of those things in your own way to your own photography when you are back out in the field. Um, join local camera clubs. That's a huge thing or a national photo association like NAMPA. There's lots of ways to network within them and learn more. Um, 
there's so much out there these days with podcasts and newsletters. There's, there's just a ton of information. Um, enter photo contests. You know, it's a good way to kind of see how your photo compares to other photos that are out there, or just look at photos that are selected. And again, you know, evaluate them. Why do some catch your eye versus others that don't? What is it about them that you really like? So final thought for you is that the most compelling photographs you take begin with the things about which you're most passionate and most curious. Like I said at the beginning of the presentation, I love being around wildlife. I just, you know, people tell me they're like, you really should, should narrow down to just one animal. And I can't, I just, there's just too many animals that I just enjoy um, photographing. Just this morning, I went out to photograph some moose and I found some pronghorn, some beautiful light with a really nice background. And I stopped to photograph them. And I liked, I actually caught one. There were three bucks there. and One had not shed the sheath off of his horns yet. And the other two had. And I liked the juxtaposition of the, the still full size horns versus the ones that are just the little points in the winter time, you know, it kinds of shows that, that change of seasons. And so you never know what you're going to come across. And then so, some information about some of the things that I'm doing. I did just update. This is an ebook that I have. It's called Preparing for the Next Shoot. There is some of the information that I've given here in it, as well as some additional things. And I've just put in a um, a bonus. There's a, a an eleventh tip in this in this latest edition that's available on my website. I did just set the dates for um, my next bear workshop is going to be September 13th to the 17th in 2023. So that will be fishing season, which I'm pretty excited about, as well as starting to get a little bit of the fall color up there. Um, and September is a beautiful time of year to visit Alaska too. So that, that information is coming on my website. I haven't, I, I literally just yesterday just confirmed those dates. So I have to put that on the website. And then I am doing a clearance sale on some of my ready, um, my pre-printed photos. Um, you can take a look at that on my website. All of those are listed um, under the um, .com slash clearance URL. And any of my, my photographs, there's prints available, available of any of them, even if they're not, if you, even if you don't see them on my website, just shoot me an email and um, let me know you're interested, something like that. And I definitely recommend following me on, on social media. Um, I've I kind of took a couple months off. I was kind of Social media has gotten kind of funky these last few, last year or so, but um, but I'm kind of getting back up to it. And as I kind of catch up with my summer and fall photography, I'll, I'll be posting some more things out there. So so definitely follow me out on, on social media um, for a little you know, wildlife of the day type stuff. So with that, I will take any questions. I haven't been looking at what the chat has in it. Um, Dawn, we do have a couple of questions lined up. Um, Dawn James, do you have those available? Yeah, let me let me take a peek here. Um, I did not see any that came in through chat. Um, if another person that can see them sees them, let me know. But I do have a question though that I like to start off with, I suppose. Sure. And that is, Dawn, when you are, I'm I'm like one of these people that has us a cheap little Canon camera and every now and then I shock myself with my iPhone or my camera um, um, pictures that I have. The question I have for you is you take some beautiful pictures so when you do the aperture change and and your ISO do you take a picture and look at it and then make adjustments and take another picture again and again or is it just a matter of just practice makes perfect you just know exactly what you're looking for. I always take, when I first get out into the field, I always take a test photograph of um, what the light's doing at that moment. And as the light changes, I will keep taking test photos so that I make sure that my, my light my settings are correct for the light so that when something interesting does happen, I don't go, dang it, my light, my settings are off. Um, so that's something I, I definitely recommend doing. Um, you know, you always want to expose for whatever's brightest. You can't bring back anything that's blown out. It's always going to be pure white. So if anything, you want to, you know, kind of ex get those exposure settings. Um, there's a little bit that you can do in post-processing, but not a, not a ton to, to retrieve any of that kind of data. Did I answer that question? Yep, you did. Thank you so much. Um, we do have one question. Where do you see moose and pronghorns? <laughs> I'm actually up in Grand Teton at the moment. I had a... Um, <laughs> I was actually supposed to be home for this and had a um, last minute request to help somebody. My 
our RV kind of had some some issues. So I came up here and I was like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna do this from the field. So um, but yeah, I was up here. The um the moose up here this time of year, once the rut's done, start to come together back into the sagebrush flats, and then pronghorn are always in the sagebrush flats. The beauty of this time of year up here is that the pronghorn haven't migrated out yet. So you in in those flats, you actually see the moose coming in, the pronghorn haven't quite left yet. The bison are still still here. They haven't left yet for the winter. Um, so you get that nice, nice mix of, of wildlife. So great. Okay. There's another question here from Brian. My wife, you've been talking. <laughs> <laughs> and I noticed that you had very pretty eyes. My question is, how do you manage to get the eyes in so many of the images? Because for me, that's sort of difficult. I, I have a hard time getting a sort of a, a picture of the eyes. So eyes are definitely the most important part. You always want to make sure those are the things that are the tack sharp aspect of a mm -hmm. photograph of animals or people. Um, mm -hmm. What a lot of times what I'll do is so, and it's kind of along the same lines with, with getting the proper exposure for lighting is I don't take you know, a thousand photos and then edit the ones out that I don't want. What I will mm -hmm. do is I will pre-focus on an eye um, as an animal is in front of me uh -huh. get that and then i use back button focus so that i can lock that that focus in and then i can recompose as that animal is doing something else that might be a little bit more interesting great great that was a good, very good answer thank you you're welcome maybe i'll get some eyes now <laughs> <laughs> well don this was fascinating and so helpful thank you so much for you're making very time welcome. to do you're this right. you're very welcome um, Don, I, I wanted to say something really quickly. You did not include in your talk about taking photo tours other than just to say you have one coming up. But <laughs> with respect to taking your photography to another level, if you guys haven't done this or had the opportunity to go out in the field with Dawn, I highly recommend it. My daughter and I did it this past summer and had the time of our lives. It's fantastic. And I learned so much and I really had a lot of fun um, now that we're back in Kentucky and both of us are, are shooting more. So um, you yeah. want to add that to your slide <laughs> slide deck because you are great. I had it in there. I'll I'll be doing it again next summer, but I usually kind of back off in the winter time. Winters just gets a little it gets a little bit harder to find wildlife. So um, so yeah, the winter time it's it's something that um, and I don't I just I don't know what my schedule is going to be like coming up. So I decided not to put it in there. I actually did have it and I took it out, but thank you, Shannon. Yeah, we had a blast. We had, her daughter actually found a, um, spotted a snowshoe hare and we were, and then we don't see them a ton when we're out. And all of a sudden we, we had this, just this ton of fun. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. It was really cool. Yeah. Well, I'm glad Sorry, to hear Mike. you guys are still doing some photographies too. Oh yeah, I was out. I'm on vacation this weekend. I was out shooting this morning. So beautiful light in Kentucky and our deer are all busy. Of course here, our white-tailed deer are busy. My cat is very busy right now. So I'm trying to distract him. Forgive <laughs> me for being distracted. But. No worries. Well, cool. Well, thank you. Thanks again. This was just outstanding and You're we appreciate welcome. it so much. Okay. All right, Celeste, um, do you want to talk about our next talk since we're looking at, we're a little bit over time? Yes, we're going to have Brian Verholtz, who works for the National Park Service, and I asked him to talk about the health of our forests. I'm particular, I was particularly intrigued by um, the diseases and the infestations that we're seeing in our local forests. So he's going to talk about how our trees uh, at different elevations are affected by climate change and how that <clears throat> increases the activity of uh, insects and some diseases. So that will be on uh, Thursday, November 18th. So join us 12 to 1. Uh, we'll try to have it at the rec center if COVID cooperates or the <laughs> vaccinations cooperate, let's say. And, and I think we're getting pretty proficient in our dual Zoom slash 
sessions. So for people like Shannon and Dawn who are in the Tetons and off in Kentucky, <laughs> <laughs> you can participate uh, via Zoom and any other guests that we have that just don't want to brave the crazy elements of the maskations. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we okay. have all become very um, competent in Zoom these days, haven't we? Yes. Well, thank you everybody for joining us and look for us uh, next month. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>